Okay, um, so the exam, I gave you 13 problems and hoping that you would have an opportunity for bonus. Um, I don't know, I had a real bad feeling when you all finished the test. The way that you all left, it, I was kind of not looking forward to grading them. And then after I graded them, what I did was normally what I do is I I look at it like you start, you start with 100, and then I start deducting points. That's the way I usually grade. But this one, what I did that was different is everyone started at zero, and I looked at every single problem, and I gave you points for all 13 problems. And then, so potentially, if you did every problem correctly, you could have got 130. And I think with that way of grading it, there was, there was kind of a, a built-in sort of curve to that because you could have got 130 points. Um, the highest grade in the class was a 119. The lowest grade in the class was a 20. We had six A's, four B's, three C's, three D's, and we're missing, <coughs> we're missing a big part of that graph there. Oops. Okay. Seven F's. Now, in terms of passing, the passing line is this red line here. So this is the group that was below 70. Um, so there's, there's a good group that was right in here that was right on the verge of passing. And then I'm a little more concerned about this group in here. Um, the class average <coughs> was a 72, or I think about a 73, which is actually a pretty good class average. I mean, it's, it's passing, right? The average is passing, and a C means passing, so or sorry, a C means <coughs> average, so if the average is within average, then things, I, I did, what I guess what I'm getting at is I did not feel like there was a need for a curve. Um, now, what else? The, the, the number I did not like was our standard deviation. Do you all know what a standard deviation is from statistics? It tells you how spread apart the data is. You know, if you have a small standard deviation, that means a lot of people were, were close to each other. Even if you all failed, you all failed together. Or if you all passed, you all passed together. So <clears throat> I'm always looking for a small standard deviation because it means y'all are all kind of at the same place. I have a huge standard deviation, 24 points. Normally, my standard, standard deviations are about 17 points. Anything over 20 is starting to get big. 24, that's really big. And so what we have is a, a, a pretty big discrepancy between where people were on this exam, all right? And I think it's, <coughs> it's indicated in the graph. What we want, what we would prefer to see is this graph flipped over. This is, you know, you always want a standard normal distribution, which is like a bell curve. You always want to see that. But as long as I've been teaching, which is for a long time, this is always what I get. I never get standard normal distributions of grades. It's either here or here, a little bit in between. Um, now, the syllabus says that you had to score 50 on this in order to even be eligible to continue the course. So if you scored below 50, I'm going to ask that you set up a time, and I'll be trying to be flexible for you to come in and sit down with me, and let's talk about where you are in the class. Let's see what we can do. I'm not going to stick to that 50, but I, I want a conversation with each of you that were in that category. So maybe we can find a path forward that'll, that'll be better for the next exam. Because you all, all you have is a final, right, and some mini exams? Okay. <clears throat> all right, feel free to look over your test. Get with me on my office hours if you have any questions. Um, you know, I, I let you take the exam home. So I don't know how many of you went home and tried to finish it up, but if you did, you know, try and find your mistakes and talk to me. Any questions, comments? Um, after this class, I am, in, I am in my office. Yes, so I'm free after this class. Anything else? <clears throat> okay. So I, I admitted to you that I challenged you a little bit on that exam, and what I meant by that was I didn't give you any problems that were brand new that you had not seen. Um, but it's the differentiation that was involved, the integration that was involved, that was a little bit 
more on the medium end at, than on the easy end. So what I was looking for was, are you demonstrating that you even know what to do with this problem or not? Are you just kind of like neurons firing without actually knowing what's happening? You know, so that's like the big thing I was looking for. And so if you were at least on the right track, you did receive quite a bit of credit. Um, but it's when you were completely off or the, it was just blank or something, that's when, that's when you lost or didn't get much in terms of points. All right, let's stop yapping. Let's just get to, down to business. We need to finish up 11.7. <clears throat> so do you all remember what we were doing? It seems like it was so long ago. We were trying to find the maximum and minimums of a surface. And we were doing it on an open interval, meaning that we were not restricting the domain at all. And how did we do that? What did we have to do? We did partial derivatives, and then set them equal to zero. And then we did some computation. What was that? It was like capital D. Remember that capital D it was like the partial partial to x, and, right? Right? All that. Yep, all that stuff squared, and then you check, is it positive, is it negative, and then you write, and that tells you. Now, that technique that we use there is kind of going to go away now, because now we're on a closed interval. So last class I talked about in Cal 1, there were two methods for finding max and mins, the closed interval method and then the open interval method. I told you we were going to do it backwards when we were here. So now we're going to talk about closed interval. So again, just a quick reminder, in Cal 1, when we had a graph of a function on a closed interval, there was a theorem that said that this function f, if it's continuous and differentiable, must attain a maximum and a minimum value. Has to, if it's on a closed interval. It has to achieve a highest point and a lowest point. And the way we did it was we found the critical numbers or critical points critical numbers, which are where our derivative was zero or undefined. And then we, we took those points and we took the endpoints. So we took the, the x coordinates of all these points, I'll call it x1, x2, and we plugged those into the function and we just looked at them and said, oh, that's the biggest one, that's the max. And we looked at the uh, others and said, oh, that's the smallest one. We just, we just compared them to each other. We're going to do a very similar method for this next part of this section. The big difference is that instead of being on a closed interval like AB, I think we're all pretty comfortable with the idea of the closed interval AB is all the numbers between A and B, including A and B. But what does a closed interval mean when our domain is two-dimensional, right? Because our domain is the ground. Our surface is up, floating above it. So our domain on the ground needs to be a closed, a closed not interval, some closed bounded region. So we need to talk about what that is. They, we call these closed and bounded sets. So remember, these pictures represent the ground, the domain of your function of two <coughs> variables. So closed sets are things that include their boundary, right? So these are the circle and a, and a square are examples of closed sets. Look at these. These are not closed. This one would not be closed because it's dashed around the outside, which means it does not include the boundary. So that would be like an open interval, like A to B, but not including A and B. That's, that's kind of the analogy we have here. This is an open set. This right here almost looks closed. Can you all see there's a little hole right there, a little dot, a little hole missing? That would not be a closed set. And then the rectangle, if it was dashed around the outside, would not, not, not be a closed set. What we are interested in is finding the maximum and minimum values of a function on a closed and bounded set. So we're looking at something like this. Now they don't have to be circle and square. It could be, you know, any strange shape, so long as it includes its boundary and everything inside of it. All right? If, if I say the name Ted Kaczynski, do you all know who I'm talking about? The Unabomber? How many of you have heard of the Unabomber? Okay, back, I don't know, he was caught a while back, but I think it was in the 70s, I could be wrong. It was over like a period of a decade or two. This guy was like putting bombs in the mail and like blowing up random people and stuff. 
Like nowadays, that's pretty mild stuff, right? But he was like the first to like start doing that stuff. And anyways, it turns out he was a mathematician and he was studying uh, what are called boundary value problems. See, when you have functions on these, these boundaries, when we don't include them, um, things, functions get very interesting on their boundaries. And, you know, we can talk about what happens on the inside of them, but once you get to the edges, strange things happen, especially like with differential equations. So he was studying boundary value problems, and I think it drove him crazy. Could have, I don't know. I've, I've just always found that somewhat fascinating that he was into mathematics. But. Okay, bounded set. Um, closed, it in contains its bound, uh, boundary. A bounded set, we didn't really talk about that. A bounded set is any set that you can draw that you can enclose it within a disk. All right, so if, if we take the plane and we say shade everything to the right of the y-axis forever, that way, those are arrows, sorry. That is not a bounded set because I cannot draw a disk around it that closes it in. Now this right here, this shape right here, that is a closed bounded set because I can draw a disk around it that contains the whole thing. All right, so here's the uh, theorem. It's, it's very straightforward. It says if you have a function and if it's continuous on a closed bounded set in two-dimensional space, so if the domain is closed and bounded, then that function f, that surface, must attain an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum somewhere within that set. So there's some point in the domain that I can plug in that I get the highest point and some point I can plug in that I get the lowest point. Now the actual process of finding it is these three steps. So first we find the critical values of the function. What does that mean to find the critical points? How do I find the critical points of f? What did we do when we were doing the previous part of this section? We're going to take the partial derivatives and set them equal to zero. So this means we're going to take the partial with respect to x, set it to zero, and then we're going to take the partial with respect to y and set it equal to zero. These will give us our critical points. All right? Now, what did we do with those critical points in the first part of this section? After we found these critical points, what did we do with them? We calculated D. That's no longer on the table. We will not have to calculate D. That's good, because D can take some time. We're going to find these points, whatever they are, all right? After we're done with that, this is the big tricky part, and this is why we do this second. This second step is very simply stated, but rather difficult to do. What we need to do is find the extreme values of the function on the boundary of the, of the closed set. So what we need to do is go around that closed set, around its boundary, and somehow look at the function's values and try and find the extreme values just on the boundary. It's going to be weird, all right? But we'll do it. Then what we do is we compare. We take these critical points from here, we plug them into the function, and we take our values that we got around the boundary, and we compare them all. The highest one is our max. The smallest or lowest one is the minimum. Do you see how it's pretty much the same as the, the Cal 1? We find the critical numbers. We're going to wind up plugging, plugging those into the or critical points. We're going to pl plug those into the function. And then this, this step two in Cal 1 was the endpoints, right? A and B. It's actually the entire boundary now. All right? And that's it. So let's, let's do an example. And you'll see how tedious these problems are. And you'll see why I didn't put one of these on the test. The exams are up here. All right. So I guess that's zoomed enough. All right, find the absolute maximum and minimum values of the function f of x, y equals 3 plus x, y plus, uh, minus x minus 2y. So that's some surface on the closed triangle with these vertices. These are two-dimensional points, right? So these live on the x, y plane. That gives us our domain, all right? So we're only allowed to plug in points from here and I'm going to draw that, and I'll be very clear here. This is the domain of our function that I'm drawing. Here's x, here's y, and I'm looking at the closed triangle with vertices 1, 0. Here's 1, 0, 
uh, five zero and one four. And then from there, I have a triangle. And I'm going to take just those points that are in that triangle and map them into the surface. And I'm going to get something, right, up on that surface. It won't be the entire surface, will it? It'll just be the image of this through that surface. And I want to know where the highest and lowest point on that little piece is. We clear? All right. Now, this gets difficult to see, so I've got some really good animations. Here, first of all, is the surface, okay? That's the original surface, not restricted at all. If I just said, hey, everyone, graph this function right here, here it is, all right? But now what we're going to do is we're going to imagine, <coughs> here's my triangle. Okay, I'm going to erase this. Here's my triangle in two-dimensional space. There's that domain that I just drew on the board, right? Over here is that same domain but in three-dimensional space, all right? So do you see how it's the ground there? And what I want to do is take those points, each one of these points, and plug them into the function. So let me bring the actual surface in here. That's the entire surface I just had, right? But I just want the points off the triangle. So if I just plug in the points off the triangle and I pull the surface out, hopefully you can see that the green part is our surface restricted to that closed set. Do you all see it? It's important that you see it. Imagine if you didn't have these pictures, right? I mean, it's a little bit more difficult to see, I think. All right, any questions, though, visually, of what we got? No? Okay. What we're looking for here are those points right there. These two up here appear to be maximums, don't they? And the two down here appear to be minimums. Now, we have to compare them all to see. Maybe this one's a little higher than this one. I don't know yet. But we're going to have to go find those points. All right? So what we do first, all right, the first thing we do is we find the critical numbers. Now, the critical numbers, when we do that, isn't it going to give us points somewhere on this surface here? Right? We have to be sure that those critical points that we find live in our triangle. It's kind of like, um, let's say that I had this function right here, and I wanted to find its maximum and minimum values back in Cal 1 between here and here. I want to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum. If you set the derivative equal to 0, wouldn't you get this? Wouldn't you actually get that point? But it would lie outside your interval. And so you would not consider it when you were testing. Same thing here. Our first step is to find the critical points of this function, and we must ensure that the critical points, if we find them, live within our little triangle. If not, we throw them out, OK? Then we have to work our way around the boundary. And we'll get to that when we get to it, all right? Questions so far? Everyone's got it visually? You don't look as excited as I thought you would be. Yes. Um, they don't necessarily have to be on the first or first set. They, they don't necessarily have to be where? On the first piece of our first set. Oh, no, they don't. Anywhere. They can be anywhere. The question was, when you go and find an absolute maximum on a surface, does it always have to be at a vertices, like at a corner or something like that? No. It can be, on, it can be at one of the vertices. It can be on one of the edges of your set. It could be on the interior of the set somewhere. And we're going to do more examples where they show up in different places. But the thing is, you have to check everything. You have to check the inside and the edges. That's the tedious part. The edges is the tedious part. All right, step one, I'm going to find the critical points. And to do this, I'm going to take my partial with respect to x and set it equal to 0. What is the partial of f with respect to x? y minus 1. That's it. Partial of f with respect to y is, what do we got? x minus 2. 
And then I've got to set each of these equal to zero, right? So these are very straightforward solutions. So y is 1 is one solution, and the other one is x is 2. So written as a point, what is, what is the critical point? 2, 1. 2, 1. OK. So we do not calculate d now. We're just going to hold on to that point. And we're going to wind up plugging it into the function. So long as it lives in our domain, does that live in our triangle? So I want to check real quick. Our triangle was, uh, what was it again? One, oh, it's right there. 1, 0 <coughs> and 1, 4. What am I doing? This was 1, 4. This was 1, 0. And this was uh, 5, 0. And obviously, 2, 1 would be in here somewhere, right? So it, uh, it lives there. So I will test it, all right? I don't care if it's a saddle or anything. I'm not, I don't, not looking at that, OK? All right, now we got to go and do step two, which is we need to find the extreme values of the function along the boundary. We're not doing anything with that answer yet, but just don't forget about it. 2, 1, we got to go back to it. So step two, find extreme values, value or values of f along boundary. OK, so when I do this, Here's how we're going to attack it. The boundary, of the, tri the boundary we have is the boundary of a triangle, right? So here's how we will do it. I'm gonna, I need to make this a little bigger so you can see this. This is, I, I think, I, I hope you like this. This is really cool. All right. OK, there's my triangle. If I were to orient the triangle, this would be kind of us looking at it just like that, right? <coughs> yes? Kind of, yeah. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this triangle into three separate lines. The boundary, right? The boundary is this line segment, this line segment, and this line segment. Agreed? So imagine if I were to restrict my domain to just this blue line and just take those points and plug just those points into my function, right? Then I should get this part, right? And if I look at that, and then let me pop it back into 3D here, look at what the image, look at what the image of that line, this is the blue line in our domain. Each point's getting plugged into the surface and it's, it's popping out, it's actually drawing a straight line, isn't it? Doesn't that look straight line to you? What I need to do is almost look at this, almost look at this back from a Cal 1 perspective. It's like I have a line in two dimensional space. Kind of make sense? I'm trying to find the largest and smallest values. So I'm going to go and, and I'm going to attack that problem by itself first. So it's like I'm going to move around this part of the boundary first. Then I'm going to move to the second line, which would be L2, which is going to be this black line along the hypotenuse. If you take just those and plug them into the function, do you see how you're getting this right here? And that looks, uh, let me spin it around so we can take a look at it from this side. That looks like what to you? A parabola. a parabola, right? So it's like this is your domain that you're plugging in. And when you draw it, you're drawing a parabola. And so we can find the, the, the maximum of a parabola on a closed interval. So look, this problem by itself, just moving along this black line, is going to reduce down to a Cal 1 problem. It's finding the maximum <coughs> of a function on a closed interval. A little closed interval. Function is the black, and we're going to use the closed interval method like we did in Cal 1. And then finally, we have to move along the red. Yes, red, which is along this back side over here, which ap again appears to be a line. OK? So you see it visually, what we're about to do? We need to do it mechanically, like algebraically now. All right, so how do we do this? All right. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll make this bigger. Not that big. 
Come on, man. I ah, forget it. I'm just going to go to a blank page here. Oh, you know what I want to do? Do it right under here. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm going to use uh, the picture of the triangle here. I'm going to need it because I'm going to label some things here. There's one. Here was uh, five, and then here was four, and I've got my triangle here. All right. Shit. Okay. I don't know, man. I felt great when I woke up. I had this weird dream last night. This dream I got arrested. I was shoplifting. I, I not intentionally shoplifting. I was. This is a weird dream. It is a weird dream. I was at I was at Pet Boys, getting a replacement uh, remote thing at four o'clock in the morning, and there was nobody in the store. And I went in there, went up to the register. No one was there. I see a bunch of guys outside, so I walk outside and. There's some guys out there, I start talking to them and say, hey, is this place open? You know, no one's in there. And I walk back in. When I walk back in, there's like eight people in there with a cop, and they're like, you're under arrest. Because I walked out of the store with a little key remote thing. I, stupid. So I got up early, and I was like, what was that all about? And now I'm tired. Now that lack of sleep's getting to me. All right, here we go. <laughs> stupid dreams. All right, L1. Let's call it L1, um, lowercase l, uppercase. I'll call it lowercase, L1. All right, so right now, we are, just, we are just dealing with L1. In other words, I don't care about anything else that's happening. The only points I'm allowed to plug in have to live on L1, all right? So can anybody tell me about the points that live on L1? They all look the same in some way. What, what do they all look like? They all have a Y coordinate of zero, right? And the X coordinate is between one and five, right? So do you agree that on L1, every point that I'm plugging in looks like x0 with x being between, you said 1 and 5? Right? So any point that you'd pick on this line would have a y-coordinate of 0 and an x-coordinate between 1 and 5. Yeah? yeah? Now, let's see. What does our function, our original surface, look like, not when we plug in x and y, but when we plug in x and 0? What does that function turn into? OK, it's linear, but what is it? We're going to replace x with x and y with 0, right? Minus x. You just get 3 minus x. That's it, right? 3 minus x. So if you were to kind of like hit that um, reformat hard drive button right now, and you just like reformat everything, go back to Cal 1, if I walked into a Cal 1 class and I were teaching this, I would say, all right, everyone, we have this function right here. This is a continuous function on a closed interval, and we want to find its absolute maximum and minimum. So what we do is we find its critical numbers, and then we plug in the endpoints, and we plug in the critical numbers, and we compare them, and we find the highest and lowest. Yes? That's Cal 1. The only difference is that the problem is actually coming to us from a different scenario, but it still breaks down to can you find the maximum, absolute max and min of a function on a closed interval. So I'm going to follow the procedure. Also, um, some, uh, you said linear, right? Remember when I plugged in that line, it, it looked like it drew a line? This is evidence that it does draw a line. It draws a line 3 minus x. All right, so I, I'm not going to use this. So that was just to remind you, okay? I'm going to use this right here. What would, <clears throat> what would the derivative of this be? What would the derivative of this function be with respect to x? It would be negative 1, right? Now, we're supposed to take derivative, set it equal to 0, and also find where it's undefined. Is this ever 0? No. This can never be 0, OK? So this <coughs> is not equal to 0 and not undefined. So that means I have no critical numbers, which means that what? What does that mean? Just test the endpoints. That means all you have to do is test the endpoints. So if I test the endpoints, I'm going to test 
What are the endpoints of this? I'm going to test 1, 0, and 5, 0. In other words, I'm going to replace the x with 1. I'm going to replace the x with 5. Now let's go ahead and plug those into the function and see what we get. So f of 1, 0. You can just plug it in right here. You don't have to go back up to the original, because we already know what happens when 0 goes in, right? So just plug in 1 there, we get 2. And then when we plug in 5, we get negative 2, all right? So this would be the max, right? And this would be the min. Just on L1. We're not saying that this is the maximum of the, in you know that green thing that I drew earlier that I had the computer draw, that green piece? And we saw there was two on top, two on the bottom. This is not the answer. We're not saying two and negative two yet, because we have to move all the way around the boundary. <coughs> all right, let's move to the next piece. The next piece is not as clean as this one, because it has some different characteristics. Are there any questions, though, on this? You sure? All right, let's move along. Let's go along the hypotenuse. You all ready for that? OK, let's go along L2. Now, L2 is a little more intense. L2, what can you tell me about all the points on L2? Hmm. They're all even with each other, but so negative. Well, there's got to be a relationship between the points because they live on a line, don't they? And we have to find, so we find the equation of that line. Yeah, you have two points, right? You have this point, this is 5, 0, and this is the point, 1, 4. So how do you find the slope of, or how do you find the equation of a line through two points? You find its slope, and then you use y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, point slope formula. Okay, so what do you get? y equals negative x plus 5? Okay, so if we do that, I'm trusting everyone in here could find the equation of that line. That's the equation we get, right? That means that all the points that live on that line have to look like what? The x-coordinate is x, right? And the y-coordinate is negative x plus 5. Make sense? What's the restriction on x? x must live between 1 and 5 again. So x must be between 1 and 5. <clears throat> What do you think I'm going to do now? Uh, not yet. I don't have a function to take the derivative of yet. But I will. Yeah, we're going to take this, right, these two points, and we're going to plug them back into the original function. So I want what is, what is, All right, I've got four more chances here. Oh, this one doesn't feel good. Oh, that one's not bad. <laughs> That's why they're all in here. They're all dead. OK. Well, I'm going to switch to a different color because I don't even like red to begin with. All right, so I'm going to plug into the function x and negative x plus 5. And I'm going into that one up there. So I'm doing 3 plus x times negative x plus 5, and then minus x, and then minus 2 times negative x plus 5. Right? And now we have a function of a single variable again, just x, right? Let's clean it up. We got 3 minus x squared plus 5x minus x uh, plus 2x minus 10. And this is going to turn into a quadratic function, right? Didn't Remember when I drew it, didn't it look like it was parabola? That was like down? Well, that's, this is evidence that that's what it is. Negative x squared plus 6x minus 7. 
nice parabola there. And what I'm trying to do is find the maximum and minimum values of this function, which is continuous, right? That's parabola, it's a nice and continuous function, on this closed interval 1, 5. So I take its derivative, I figure out where it's zero, I figure out where it's undefined, and then I evaluate at the endpoints and at the critical numbers, and then I've got more candidates now, right? And then I'll have to move along line three and do the same thing. So you see why I didn't put this on the test. It's just not, you need a little more time for a problem like this. <coughs> Plus, moving along a triangle is relatively easy. It gets a little more complicated. It can be, the regions can be a little more complicated. All right, keep going. Uh, let's take our, our function here. We're taking the derivative of this function at x negative x plus 5, and we get negative 2x plus 6. And what do we do with that? We set it equal to 0. So if we set that to 0, what do we get? x is 3. And if we set, um, well, is it ever undefined? Those are the two things we have to check, isn't it? When we're looking at critical numbers. This doesn't happen, right? This is a nice linear function. It's never undefined, so we're good. So we do have a critical, num a critical number here, don't we? Okay. So now, now what? Plug them back in, right? Now when you say plug them in, what do you mean by that? I'm going to replace x with 3, right? What else am I going to replace x with? 1 and 5. So we're going to test three different things now. We're about to test um, plugging in 3. Now what happens if I plug in 3 for x? What's y? What's this? Zero. Nope, if I replace that with 3, what's? This is 2. This is two. So I'm going to test that point. I also have to test the point 1 in here. What's, what do I get if I plug in 1? 4. And then if I plug in um, 5 for x, it's 0, right? I need to plug those in. Questions? Let's do it. What's f of 3, 2? You, you have an op two options here. You can plug just 3 into the parabola we just had. <coughs> what was that parabola? Negative x squared plus 6x seven. minus 7. We had this, right? You could just plug the 3 into this and get an answer. Or you could plug in 3 and 2 into that, and you'll get the same result either way. So what do you, uh, what do you want? Doesn't matter to me. Okay, y'all plug in 3 into here, and I'll plug 3 and 2 into there, and we should both get the same thing. So 3 plus, I'm doing 3 times 2 minus 3 minus 2 times 2. So I'm getting 3 plus 6, 9 minus 3 is 6. I'm getting 2. Is that what you got? All right. So you should get 2 come out when you plug in 3, 2. Yes? Okay, what about 1, 4? I think I'll do this one on this. So 1 here, I don't have to worry about the 4. So 1 here, 1, so that's 5, negative 2. And then when we plug in 5, 0, negative 2. All right, we're almost done. We just have to move along line 3 now. There's no difference. I mean, there's no difference in, in what's going to come out. Re remember, this, by doing this, we're saying that you must live on that line, right? So whatever the x value is, the y value has got to be, this is the relationship between the two. So if you go back to the original function, right, plug in 3, 2, it's the same as plugging just 3 into the parabola. That parabola came from using this as our x and our y. I don't know if that makes sense, if I answered your question. But. Can we do L3? This one? 
L3. And then we will have gone all the way around and we will compare all the different values. Uh, let's, let's box these up. We have, we have these three, right? Right there, those three. And then from, the, from L, that was from L2. From L1, we had the two endpoints, right? We had at, uh, at one zero and at five zero, didn't we? Notice that we have five zeros appear twice. That's okay. We, we just, we caught it because it belongs to both lines. All right, tell me about L3. It's a nice straight line, isn't it? Okay, they all have, on L3, they all have an X value of one, right? The X coordinate on L3, all these points have a one for X. The thing that's different is the Y coordinate. The Y coordinate changes. And what is the restriction on that Y? Zero to four. So now what we do is we take this generic point and we plug it into our function. So let's plug that point into our function. We're looking at what is f of 1y. And so I'm replacing x with 1 and y with just y. And I get this. 3 plus 1 times y minus 1 minus 2y. So what do we get? 2 minus y, which is linear, isn't it? Um, we have a function of y now, not x, right? It's a function of y. But all the calculus is still the same here. We're going to take the derivative, right, with respect to y, and then set it equal to 0, and figure out if it's undefined. So what is the derivative of this with respect to y? We just get negative 1, right? Is that ever 0? This is, this is not ever going to be 0. Is it ever undefined? No. Is that the critical value for that point? There is no critical value. There is no critical number. Well, um, what I'm saying is well, we're taking the derivative to find a critical value That's right. on that line. But since that critical value is not all living on that line, we just throw it out. No, th this doesn't have a critical value. Because to have, a critical, to have a critical number, you must set the derivative equal to 0. But the derivative is a constant. So the derivative can never be set equal to 0. No, but like the previous equation, like this one, uh -huh. the critical value was 3. Yes. So it lived on that line. Yes. So we used it. That's why this one gave yes. you the equations. That's what I'm asking. Yes. This point right here, 3, 2. That was the point 3, 2, lives on that line. Now, what if we're given the constant that is actually in that line? Like, if the constant is, is, is 1 rather than negative 1, would we still use that constant? Which constant are you talking about? The one, the, that one. Yes, that one. If it was a 1 instead of a negative 1, would we still use it? If this was a 1, no, because w remember what we're trying to do. If somebody gives you a function and you're trying to find its where it goes up and down, you need the derivative to be 0. This is telling me that the derivative is negative 1, that it's never 0, that it's not 0. Okay, so you need the variable of 1. I need a variable in here to set equal to 0 to get a number. Okay, that's one. Right. Yep, okay. All right, so no solutions here, right? So that means I'm only going to test what? The two endpoints. So I'm going to replace what with what? Y with 0 and then? y with 4. So I need to test what do those points look like? 1, 0, one, zero and 1, 4. Now have we done those already? Look back. Didn't, on L1, didn't we do 1, 0? Yes. Sir. Right, because 1, 0 is this point and 1, 4 is this point. So we've already done these, haven't we? Yes. So I actually don't need to recompute them. I have them right there, or you have them right there. Um, what were they? One zero was what? Two. Two, and then this one was negative two? two? Okay. All right. So we're ready to put this all together now. All right? Everything comes together now. We're going to look at the very first part, which is where we set the partials equal to each other. <coughs> Remember the, the number we got there? What did we get there? 
What was it, 2, 1? So from part 1, we had that point 2, 1. Did we ever plug that into the function? We never did, did we? Right? We never did? From part 1? What is f of 2, 1? Bless you. 3 plus 2 times 1 minus 2 minus 2 times 1. What is that? 1? OK. Then from part 2, we had from L1, what were the two we had? F of 1, 0, and that gave us 2. And we had F of 5, 0, that gave us negative 2. Then from L3, L2, we had F of 3, 2. Was it 3, 2? What did we get when we plugged in 3, 2? We got 2. And then what were the other ones? It wasn't at 5, 0. It wasn't at 5, 0. We did 5, 0. But we also did 1, 4, didn't we? I'm not going to write 5, 0 again because I already have it. So 1, 4. And there we got negative 2. And then what about from L3? These two here? Which we already have there, right? So this is our master <laughs> final list of, well, we're comparing all five of those points to one another. And we're looking for the max and the min. So what is the maximum value two. of this function? Maximum value is 2. So max value is 2. Now, you could write 1, 0, 2. You could write 3, 2, 2. To, to let everyone know that this max value actually happened at two different points, didn't it? Now, what about the minimum value? It was negative 2, and where did that happen? At 5, 0, 2, negative 2, and then 1, 4, negative 2. Whew. All right, that took us, what, like 40 minutes? Nope, nope. Um, they're going to be straight lines or they're going to be curves that you're familiar with. Okay, so they're not going to be some like arbitrary. Yeah, you won't have anything. So, so we're not going to get like fractions. Um, you mean fractions in the like the equation of the lines? Is that what you mean? Yeah, because you said, you know, because we're having to see like if something is undefined, so I'm assuming there's going to be a point. Oh, thing. yeah, well, let's do something a little more interesting. Okay, this one seems okay. Um, look, this function is very similar to the one we just had in terms of it being, you know, x squared minus 2xy plus 2y. It's, it's like a polynomial. It's not too difficult to deal with. What, is this, what does this mean? What is d, the domain, is equal to the set of all points x and y such that your x's are between 0 and 3 and your y's are between 0 and 2? It's a square. Well, square rectangle, right? Your x's are between... 0 and 3, so you can be anywhere between 0 and 3, but then your y's have to be between 0 and 2. So anywhere in here and anywhere in here. So that just draws out this little rectangle like this. That's D. All right? Another way this could be written, you might see this notation, you will see this notation later, is 0, 3, cross 0, 2. Now, I do not confuse that with a cross product, OK? Because these aren't vectors. These are intervals. This notation, written a different way, looks like this. 0, 3 by 0, 2. Zero, three by zero, two. So you have to understand that this is the x-coordinate restriction, and this is the y-coordinate restriction. Another way you can write it, uh, no, sorry. Take that back. 
I was going to use absolute value, but that's not correct. What would this be if, if it was this? How, how would that be different? You could go, this would mean from 3 to negative 3 and 2 to negative 2, so that, that's, that's not the same. Okay, so we restrict it there. So what do you think you're going to need to do here? I mean, the first thing, you find the critical numbers, right? Do the partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, set them equal to 0, get an answer. But then you're going to have to go around the boundary. So L1, L2, L3, L4. Now the good thing about these L's is that they're all horizontal or vertical lines. So like here, what can you tell me? Uh, we'll call this L1. I'm not going to work this whole problem out, but let's just talk about the setup. What do all these points look like on L1? X0, and what's the restriction on the X? Um, 0 to 3. What about L2? We'll make L2 this one right here. They all look like 3Y. They all have a, an X coordinate of 3. And then the Y values are between 0 and 2. How about L3? This one we'll call L3. It doesn't matter how you do this, OK? You can go, you call this L1. Okay, L3, what can you tell me about L3? All the, all the y's are 2, and the x's are free to be between 0 and 3. And then if we call this one L4, <clears throat> then our x is 0. And the y's are between 0 and 2. Make sense? But don't forget, your first step <coughs> is to take the partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, set them equal to each other, and get it, try and get a critical no, uh, point. Make sure that point lives in this rectangle. If it doesn't live in here, you throw it out. Okay? And then if you want, you could even, if it lives in here, like let's say you get a critical point and it lives in there, go ahead and plug it into the function now, because you're going to do it later. And then just hold on to that value, and then you'll just start creating your list. <clears throat> Let's see if there's another problem that's a little more interesting, I guess. Yeah, something interesting. Here we go, something like this. Some like something with just a crazy number of sides. Yeah, on the in-class test, I'm going to give you like a 16-sided oh closed God. region. <laughs> no, I'm just, you got L1, L, L1 through 16. L1 through 16. That's your entire test. No. What's it? Oh, that's what we're about to do. Yeah, we're about to do one like that. So look at this one. Find the absolute maximum minimum values of the function f of x, y equals, oh, x, y squared. Looks so, so innocent, doesn't it? x, y squared. Here's the, here's the actual surface. Pretty cool. Pretty cool looking surface. Um, but we want to restrict it on this. D, the set of points x, y, such that your x's are bigger than or equal to 0, your y's are bigger than or equal to 0, but your x and y's must satisfy this equation. Is that me? Oh, sound like felt my pocket vibrate when that went off. It's so loud, right? Are you okay? It kind of hurt, man. x squared plus y squared must be less than or equal to 3. So if this said x squared plus y squared equals 3, everyone needs to recognize that as being a circle with the radius square root 3, right? That's what that would mean. But we want everything less than or equal to it. So let's see if we can look at this domain. <coughs> Square root of 3, I don't know what that is, like 1 point something, right? There's root 3. I could draw a circle. It's supposed to be everything inside, right? However, my x coordinate and y coordinate have to be bigger than um, or equal to 0. So it's only going to be this first quadrant part and everything in here. That's our D. Understand? So let's do the first part of this 
Oh, let's look at it. Can we look at it? This is, I mean, I didn't write all this code for nothing. Here's our little region on the ground. Here's our surface. Just that, just part of the surface. If I plug in just that part and take out the surface, we're looking at this little green, this little green thing here. We're trying to find the maximum values of that little green part. Let's do it. It's my first step. Critical. So I'm going to take the partials, set them equal to zero. So partial with respect to x is y squared. Partial with respect to y, 2x, y, and that's it. So set both of these equal to zero. So if I set this equal to zero, I only get one answer, right? y is zero. So the only way to make this first partial equal zero is if y is zero. Okay, what about this one right here? Set that to zero. You can have x is zero or y is zero. Right? Hmm. This is a little tricky. Just a little tricky. There's an infinite critical points. Why? How? What do you mean? If y is 0, this one says, look, for this to be true, y must be 0, right? So let's imagine that y is 0. If y is 0, then isn't this automatically 0 and x doesn't matter? That means that anything along the x-axis is a critical point, any number. Because every point along the x-axis has a y-coordinate of 0. You see that? Now, additionally, we also have 0, 0. Right? If, there, if x is 0 and y is 0, it is a critical point. But look at where that is. It's still right here, right? It's still on this line. So our, our conclusion from this is that any point on the x-axis is a critical point. And that's an infinite number of points. Now, that turns out to be OK. Why is that OK? Because it's also our boundary, right? We're going to move along this anyway. We're going to go from here to here. And we're going to call that L1. So it's a, we're going to take care of those when we, when we actually move around, all right? Now, that's L1. Um, let's call this one over here. L3, and eh, I don't know. Maybe I should have called it L2. Do we, do we want to call this L2? I mean, it's not really a line, is it? It's not a line. It's a curve. So maybe we call it C1? Unless you want to call it L2. I don't care. Let's call it C1 for curve 1. So we're going to move along L1, C1, and L3. Call that L2 if you don't like L3. All right, let's move. Let's move around. Let's do L1. Well, can you tell me about all the points on L1? They all look like the y is 0, x is free. x must be between 0 and root 3. OK. Um, let's go ahead and plug into the function all the points that look like that. And what do you get? Us, uh, yeah, what do you get when you plug in all those points that look like that? You just get zero. Always. Do I need to take a derivative? I don't need a derivative. This is a constant function. Constant functions don't go up and down. So it only has one value, zero. The whole time you move along this line, it was zero. 